the same same concepts uh, that we have seen uh, the separation of concerns and everything that you that you have might find is available in MBBM architecture as well. Uh, so we'll go through uh, this architecture and see what's what are the things it solves and what are the things uh, it uh, it makes uh, its implementation a little bit hard than the NT architecture. Okay. So we'll look, look into the MVVM architecture. So definition of MVVM architecture, let's have a quick discussion on that. Uh, so MVVM is one of the architecture pattern, uh, enhance, uh, patterns with enhanced separation of concerns. It allows separating user from the logic, uh, business or the backend logic. It's uh, target with the MVC pattern and goals. It's um, Achieve the following principle, keep it simple and free up the logic in order to make it, it easier to manage, okay? So basically MVVM pattern, uh, what it does is it's it's gonna separate the concerns, separate by the concern in the sense, uh, if you guys can remember the NT architecture, uh, we have a separate layer for, uh, separate layer for business logic, right? So the same business logic layer uh, can be separated in uh, MVVM architecture. So uh, by using the MVVM architecture, the main difference that you will see is its um, reactiveness, how it's uh, how it's gonna work um, reactively to the application. By, by if you guys can remember in the NT architecture, we we use the controller. Yes, we use the controller, and the controller calls. For the service the service does uh, service call for the repository and once the separate rep repository is done uh, repository will bring uh, back us the data and those data will be uh, processed in the service the service will then then return everything back to the um, back to the controller layer so each layer is communicating with each other in a one way manner okay the other way it's gonna call back uh, in uh, call back the same way that we have called it but in in vvm architecture we have the separation of con concerns but in a different manner of interaction with each other okay so uh first we we decouple these um uh acronyms okay first thing is the m m stand for model so model represent the data and the business logic of the app. One of the recommend implementation strategies of this layer is to expose data through observable to be uh, decoupled completely from view model or other observable observer or consumer. This will be illustrated in an example app. Okay. So in the model, what we do is we do the business logic of the application. Okay, so if you if you want to say for example need to call uh, a database, we need to call an external API, we need to do some calculation, all the things that we are supposed to do within the uh, application, we are doing that within the model layer. Okay, so model is uh, is a place where we do all the business logic, but um, when we are exposing these data, so the model uh, process data model uh, will get some data from database, uh, REST API, whatever the data source, whatever the data that we are getting, we are not directly exposing those uh, to the consumer. We are exposing those things as observable. Okay, so we'll see what observables are. Just keep in mind, we don't uh, allow direct consumption of data. But instead of uh, that, we are uh, exposing those things as observables. Okay, keeping that, that is the most important point. Then we have uh, v VM, that is view model. So, sorry. Sorry, view model in, uh, interacts with the model and pre uh, prepares observables that can be observable by a view. View model can optionally provide hooks on the view pass through even to the model. One of the important implementation strategies of this layer is decoupling with view. Example, view model should aware of the view who is interacting with. So the next 
next section of the, our application is called view model okay so view model is something like a bridge a bridge between model and the view so view model its uh, main purpose is that um, it, it's going to be interacting with the model and the view in an observable manner okay so it's like a, a middleman or a broker that says okay model get this and once you are done i will inform that to the view okay also the same thing goes uh, for the view model view model is expecting uh, some inputs from the view and the view is uh, is knowing the view or uh, view knows about the view model but it does not know where the data or the or, or the model where it is coming from it is abstracted from the view uh, itself so the finally what we need to know is the view uh, view uh, is the view that uh, parent observe or subscribe to view models observable get data in order to update the ui uh, elements accordingly so in a view basically it's what you can see within the application so for example in an android application you would see the uh, buttons you would see the text you would see uh, you would see um, other things uh, in a, um, a progress bar or something like that anything that you can visually interact is what we call a view so the view get data from the view model okay so initially we might get some data from uh, we our thinking process that what right right now we have is we are getting uh, data directly from the model but that is not a good pattern in the mvvm architecture we always get data from the view model itself so the view model is providing data uh, to the view but in an observable manner so we talked observable observable so many times let's see uh, how these uh, application are interacting with each other okay so first thing that we need to know that the, the application that we are building is uh, separated on these through these three layers that we talked we have the view we have the view model uh, look at that pencil thing okay yeah so we have the view and we have the view model and we have the model itself okay so the model can be various data sources we call this repository it can be either a local data source it can be a remote data source it's up to it's up to us uh, to decide where our data is uh, coming from so it can be a remote data source maybe an api or something like that or a local data source maybe something like a database okay we can either have two of these data sources or one of these data sources. It's up to the application. But either way, the repository is, is the place where we fetch data, we do our logical transaction, and so on and so forth. Okay. So the view model, in, the, in, the, in, in, in a sense, view model is like um, a place where we, um, we interact with the repository and we we uh, say anything that we uh, we need to fetch we need to get some data we have the view model to can uh, communicate with the model and the view view itself as as we mentioned earlier the view is representing all the ui that we uh, we are that we are interacting with maybe a button maybe a text so whatever you are interacting with it's going to be a view okay uh do i have this zoom thing okay all right so uh remember when we talked about everything uh, we talked about the observability so in this diagram the observability is represented by this um, by this array uh, okay you guys can't see the uh... okay sorry uh, maybe i 
Android Studio, maybe. Um, yes, there. I uh, hope you guys can see the screen, right? Again. You guys can see the screen, right? Yes, sir. No, we can see. Okay, sure. Sorry about that. So um, in the MVVM architecture in here, what we are talk uh, when we are talking about the observability, the observability is represented with this dashed arrow or dotted arrow for, for, uh, for simplicity. So any interaction, any direct interaction uh, with each of these layer is represented by a solid arrow and anything that is observed that is represented by uh, a dotted or a um, uh, yeah, dotted arrow. So view directly interact with the view model using UI events, such as if you tap on a button, if you tap on a text, if you put uh, put some uh, something some inputs, so anything like that, we do, we 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 uh, make we uh, make uh, we are making that as a UI event. So there is a direct communication with the view model, and we are representing that. Okay. So if the view model want to uh, communicate with model, yes, you can send a direct request to the model. Okay, you can send a direct request to the model that is acceptable. Okay, and the repository it is also the same. Uh, there there can be more than one repository, as I mentioned. There can be a local repository or a remote repository. Any data source that we are interacting we can either have a local data source that is a direct communication or a remote repository that is also a direct communication that is coming from the repository or the view model itself. But whenever we are getting, uh, we are getting something, we are getting, uh, uh, we are sending back the data, what we have is an observable, okay? So send response in an observable manner. When, uh, when the repository change, uh, when something changes in the repository, we send it through an observable change, okay? So when the view model need to communicate with the view, okay, the data has changed, the logic has changed for some reason, we do that in an observable manner. So everything that there is, uh, that is done, uh, done uh, within the, view model repository the communication that goes back what is the response on these things we are not directly sending it back we are sending it as a observable okay so what do you understand by your observable what do you mean by observable so uh, we have a different uh, different uh, thinking pattern uh, we have different thinking pattern uh, 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 we have different thinking pattern on on these on this application um, application creation. So the main uh, thing is that uh, the view and the view model and the repository these all are separatable separated. Okay. So if if we if we developed an application. Uh, we we might do that in uh, in application development where everything is within the view layer. Okay, the logics, everything. Uh, if a but button clicks, what happens within that button clicks is within the view. Uh, is within the uh, uh, is within the app, 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 uh, within the view. So. We are separating these layers. So separating these layers gives us benefits. Okay, we'll see what are the benefits and what are the things that uh, that it made uh, that made it uh, more more uh, robust application architecture. We will see what is the anti pattern and we will see what is the best practice. Okay, so observability we need to we need to make sure what what do we understand by observability so uh, anyone here have heard the term synchronous communication 
synchronous communication. Anyone knows what, what do you understand by synchronous communication? No, nobody. What do you understand by synchronous communication? Anyone knows? Okay, so when we are doing a synchronous communication, what happens is, uh, let's say for example, we we have a method A and um, we call that method A and once the call is made, um, the immediate result is given back to us. Okay, the immediate result is given back to us. So we there is no waiting, there is uh, whatever the time it takes, okay, whatever the time it takes to execute the, that function will take. And once it is done, it will return back the data, okay, whatever the functions are supposed to return. So that is the synchronous communication. We, we do not wait, we, we, uh, we run everything in, in one single call. Once the call is done, we get our uh, data back. And there is asynchronous, um, asynchronous uh, functions or asynchronous calls. So what happens in asynchronous functions is that we do make a request, we do call a function, but the uh, call, the function might not return values as, um, as immediate at, at, as it should be, okay? For example, we uh, when we are calling a method okay we 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 need to get that data from uh, another server we need to get that uh, data from another database or we are calling another uh, external uh, external third party api so we can't act we can't uh, assume as soon as we call we will get back the data because there can be there can be a uh, little bit of waitings because of network issues, latency issues, that kind of things will block uh, the immediate call, but it will eventually give us result. It will take a little bit of time. So what we are doing in a synchronous call is when we are calling a function, the function will ex we start to execute, but we won't get we won't get that uh, results as immediate as as it is. But eventually, some point in the time in the future, okay. So uh, uh, I will make a request now, and after one two seconds, depending on the workload or whatever the thing is, the eventually some some uh, some time in future, I will get back the result. Okay. So what I will do is rather than I am waiting for that two seconds, three seconds, I don't know how much time it will take. It can vary on uh, so many uh, different scenarios. So rather than waiting on somebody's uh, giving me that the result for the function that I call, I will wait until it comes back with the result. Okay. So in asynchronous call, I call the function, I get the data back, that is done. But in asynchronous call, asynchronous calls, what I do is I call the function and the function will say, okay, wait a little bit uh, after I am done executing, after I got every data, I will give you back the result. Okay, that is the mental picture behind synchronous, asynchronous calls. Okay, so asynchronous call will give you data in the future. Okay, once the data is there, okay, once the data is there in asynchronous call, you can say, okay, I received the data. Thank you very much. And I will proceed with my things. But there is the other element in here that is called observability, observable response. So in observability, it is going to give, it is, uh, you can think it is as a type, a, a type of asynchronous thing, but in a different way. So if you guys can remember in asynchronous calls, we request something and we get something back in the near future or some somewhere around the future. In observer, we we do that the same, we do that same thing, 
but we will get continuous continuous uh, data until we unsubscribe okay so observability comes uh, something like this uh, it is what we call a subscribe and unsubscribe method so uh, in observable function what happens really is when we want to fetch some data we we do call that function we call an observable function but rather than a synchronous call uh, we we do not uh, uh, we do not uh, use the term call we use the term subscribe okay so what in the observable observable stream what we do is we have uh, what we call a subscription we subscribe to a subscription and until we are subscribed to that subscription we get data along the way okay so let me take a simple example uh, from day-to-day -day activities okay so uh, you guys know uh, this is not the correct uh, example but at least something that close to us okay so uh, you guys know that uh, uh, let's say modern day examples like uh, let's say YouTube. Okay, so you have YouTube. You have in YouTube you have different channels, right? You have different channels. You have different uh, uh, different content and everything. Say for example, you are interested in uh, a certain uh, certain channel which gives you like let's say entertainment uh, news or something like uh, programming news. So what do you do? So when, if you need something, if you need that data, okay, there is something called a button called subscribe. Okay. So once you hit the subscribe button, okay, once you hit the subscribe button, what will happen is whenever there is a new video, whenever there is a new data point, you will get notified. Okay. So as long as you subscribe to that channel, you will get notifications, right? You will get notification. Okay, this uh, this person has uploaded a new video. This person has uh, uploaded a new short. That kind of information is coming to you. Okay, and say for instance, you don't need this information anymore. Said uh, you don't need uh, this information anymore. So what you will do is what you will do is you will unsubscribe. As soon as you unsubscribe, the data, the notification that you are receiving, the uh, from that channel is gonna stop okay so as long as you are subscribed to that you will get the notification as soon as you stop subscribing you won't get notifications you won't get any data about the updates so that same mental model we have in observability okay so we have something called a stream uh, think the stream as a channel uh, a youtube channel so we have a stream and once we subscribe to that stream, that means we are subscribed into the channel. And uh, as soon as you subscribe, you will get messages. Okay, it does not mean as soon as you subscribe, you will get all the messages. No, as soon as the source, the subscriber sends you message, you will get those messages. Okay, so in subscription model, what will happen is, as soon as you subscribe to a stream, you will get the notification. As soon as you unsubscribe, you will get, uh, stop getting this notification. Okay. So keeping that in mind, so uh, the subscription is a data stream. Okay. It's not going to give you one, one data and it will stop. No, it will continuously push you new data until you unsubscribe. Okay, so that is the mental uh, thinking pattern about observability. So you are listening in, you are listening into a data stream until you un unsubscribe. Okay, you are subscribed into a data stream until you unsubscribe. So that is the mental uh, picture behind observability. So don't get uh, confused with the synchronous, asynchronous, and observability. So these three are three different concepts synchronously. You call, you get something. Asynchronously, you call, you have to wait a little bit. And once you get the data, that is done. In observability, you subscribe, you get data. 
As long as you subscribe, you will get data. As soon as you stop uh, subscribing, you will uh, not get any notification. Okay. So hope that makes more clear about observability, asynchronous and synchronousness. So in most of the application that we might have developed, we might be using the synchronous way or asynchronous way. So we we do something and it, 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 it immediately works. And there is asynchronous manner. So we do something, it will, uh, it will do uh, a call or um, uh, something in the background. Once it is done, you will get the uh, results. And with the uh, observable architecture, so you subscribe to something and the observer will give you as long as you are subscribed. As soon as you are unsubscribed, you will lose the data stream. Okay. So why this observable response is important, we will see it in action and we will see how observability will help us. Okay. So remember this architecture, um, especially the arrows. The arrows represent something uh, very important. These are direct communication. These are observable uh, communications. So by using this MVVM architecture, uh, so what do you, uh, what is the um, advantage that you will get using this MVVM pattern? So the MVVM uh, uh, pattern uh, help us to encapsulate business logic. Okay. And so that means uh, anything that happens within the business logic stays in that layer. Anytime the view changes, we, we do not have to worry about view changes. The business logic remains same and it will, uh, it will work with any view. As long as the data is supplied, the view is not aware of the logic. Okay, the view is dumb enough to just to show whatever we are sending the view, um, the view model or the business logic or model will do the calculations and uh, give give us back the values. So, uh, so when we are adopting this MVVM pattern, we can encapsulate, we can separate our business logic, our views, and our view model into three different layers. By doing that, what we can achieve, okay? So. Uh, when we are developing a large application, when you are developing a large uh, application, it's it shouldn't be an Android or a, a mobile or a web. But given the complexity of the application, uh, one single person is not going to work on one single uh, section. Okay, so there are people specialized in uh, some sections. Some are really good at making UIs. Okay, there is uh, I I have. Uh, I have worked with such people. So we if, they, if, if we give them the view, view, they will build it immediately. I mean, they are taking less uh, less time than the average developers. They, will, they are specialized in view. They can uh, manipulate any view, any view orientation, whatever they, they need. They are really good at developing UIs, OK? And there are people who are really good at running queries, uh, fetching data, and business logic. That same people, same same person, might not be very good at developing UIs. Okay, that happens. The, the, the teams team have variety of things, variety of people, variety of uh, um, variety of uh, what do you call the talents are uh, within uh, within some people. So what we can do is we can separate our uh, task or separate our workload between these two people. So the person who is really good at making views, he or she can work on the view implementation only. The people who are really good at uh, making database connection, API dependent injection, view models and coding stuff, they can focus on view model. And once they are done, the seamless integration is gonna happen. Okay, as long as they, uh, as long as they uh, agree upon, uh, they as long as they agree upon a data model, and they can work separately or se uh, individually with on with on their own layers, and they can achieve the same uh, same uh, 
uh, greatness or same application at the end without any hiccups. Okay, so you don't have to worry about, uh, okay, um, I have this application, this application, uh, uh, the UI is different, what I asked for is not here, the data is not there, you can't blame on one another. You agreed upon something, both of you are developing uh, the application, the UI designer will uh, design the UI based on the model. The uh, view model designer, the logic designer is responsible for providing that data. Okay, so both of them are working separately and the integration will be seamless. So our tasks will be much easier to handle. And the next thing is, um, developers can develop uh, test testable applications without using the view, okay? So most of the time, if you guys can remember, when we are developing an application, when we are developing an application, we need to write test, okay? That is uh, not, uh, writing test is not what we call uh, something that we can ignore, no. As a software developer, as a good software architect or software engineer, uh, you're writing unit test or some sort of test is a must. Okay, that is a part of what, what you are developing. It is your responsibility to write test. If you are writing a code without test, that is something like uh, you are going on a highway in 400, 400 kmh or 400 uh, uh, miles per hour without any safety on. Okay, you, you are doing something great, but as soon as you miss something, then you are jeopardized, okay? So do not write any code, any uh, code without writing any test cases. So remember, uh, test case writing is uh, something crucial. Uh, but if if you write uh, spaghetti code, right? We have view in, uh, we have all the views, we have all the uh, logics in everything in one single layer it will make a nightmare to write code and nightmare to write testing for these applications, okay? So by simply splitting these things up, by simply, okay, we will write a unit test for our model, we will write our unit test for our view model, and we will write some sort of end-to-end -end test for our views. So by separating these concerns, since we have separate concerns, we do not rely on the view uh, to write any unit test. So completely, the business logic is independent of the view. That means this logic will be able to execute within an Android application. And uh, let's say we have written a server-side application, which is also in Kotlin. The same business logic should work in server-side application, okay? So the layer is not depending on the view. The business logic is purely uh, written in Kotlin or whatever the language. So we can test the logic individually without depending on Android, without depending on the server. We can test these things individually. So that is a great advantage. That's because um, uh, loading the Android system, loading the test for views and everything, it, it is going to be really cost, okay? The cost is loading the view, loading the emulator, loading the simulator. It's a cost. But when we are running unit test completely independent of the Android system, the unit test will be way more faster. The unit test will have uh, uh, the speed uh, that a normal program would have. You don't have to rely on the Android or Android views. So unit testing will be much more simpler when we are using uh, this MVVM pattern. We can separate these concerns and test those things individually, okay? And yeah, the app UI can be redesigned without touching of the code, provided we've implemented the entire in XML. Therefore, new version we should be up with the existing UI. Okay, the next thing is, uh, let's say for example, that's, that's happened right now in Android, the, um, the uh, the um, 
what do you call uh, the common implementation of views okay when we when we want to create a view we say for instance we want to create a screen and within that screen we want a button we want some text we want some inputs so when we want to create such a view then traditional way or the um, let's say of the old way is to define these things using an xml file okay we will see that uh, in a moment we can use these xml files to define our view using like uh, if you guys uh, i think most of you guys have touched html it is like html but it's in xml uh, we want to define something we define it in xml and we we can compose a view okay so we have a button and everything within an xml document and we, we, we will be using that xml document to represent our view so our view is represented by uh, XML documents. That is the old way of doing things. But later on, um, Android have moved a code base, or we call uh, uh, we we call this uh, uh, a more declarative code. That means we don't write any views on XML. We write the code. The, we write the view in code. Okay. So if I want uh, if I want a button, I just write that thing in a code. Okay, so that is what we call Jetpack Compose. So right now, uh, the applications that we are uh, that we are developing, um, I would recommend we would go to uh, Jetpack Compose. That is the latest. Okay, so what about the uh, people who have developed using XML? So what what will happen to them? Uh, so the answer is if they have in if they have correctly implemented MVVM pattern or something like that, they should be easily able to remove the XML-based XML -based application, XML-based views, and replace with Jetpack Compose ones. So the view layer, because they are developed independently, the MV, in MVVM pattern, view layer is independent on the other. So we should be able to anytime, anytime we want to remove the uh, view layer, we should be able to remove and define a new layer on it. Okay, so that is one uh, advantage. Anytime we should be able to remove one of these layers and replace it with another, and it should seamlessly work. Okay, so that is one of the thing uh, these uh, layers should provide. Uh, the example that I have provided, the view layer, uh, earlier on we have XML based uh, UIs, now we have Jetpack Compose based UIs. So anytime when the user want to uh, remove the XML ones and replace it with the uh, Compose based one, they should be able to do without a hassle. Okay, so that is one of the important things. So you can change the layers anytime and have an have a different implementation on that and the next thing is uh, uh, designers and developers can work independently currently working on their component during the development person they will focus on the view developers work on the view model and components that's what i told earlier they can work independently and uh, the ui designers can mainly focus on designing uh, the developers can mainly focus on the uh, application development, the logical implementations. Okay, the key to using MVVM efficiently is uh, lies underlying how to factor the code into correct classes and underlying how the classes interact. The following section discusses responsibilities and classes in MVVM pattern. Okay, so we will we will see it in action. So make sure MVVM is a pattern. Okay. Uh, there are things that you should do and you should not do. By you by doing, uh, by uh, introducing MVVM, and if you do uh, uh, anti patterns, what we call these anti patterns, then again MVVM can't help you. Okay, so we have to see uh, what what do we understand by uh, patterns and what what should we avoid doing when we are using MVVM. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, by introducing MVVM won't solve every problem, 
you have to practice and MVVM also introduce set of problems as well. We will uh, we will look into the, those things as well. So don't think MVVM will solve all your problems. No, that is not the case. It has its own drawbacks and it has own patterns that we need to follow. So uh, NVVM is one of the uh, application patterns. Okay, so before NVVM, how did we code this? So before NVVM, how do we um, how do we arrange our application? So there are there were uh, and there there will be more patterns to come. So um, there is MVC, MVI, MVP, MVVM, and uh, MVP. There are a lot of patterns out there, okay? So each and every pattern, a, a, an architectural pattern, try to solve something and it introduce some, uh, some drawbacks as well, okay? So if you, if you uh, it, uh, uh, so this MVVM pattern and all, it is good when we, when we interact in huge application, when we are developing huge application, it is good. So if you are if you are trying to uh, come up with a simple solution, like uh, when we click a button, we will get some data and we show it a one page application. We don't need to make it too complicated. We can just use everything in one slide and it will work. But in an application, there are a lot of pages, there are a lot of interaction going on, there are a lot of, uh, moving parts in the application, then what we will need to, need to do, we need to organize our code. Okay, so MVVM is one of the organization patterns that architects, developers come across and they have found a solution. Ah, okay, let's do this. Let's do, let's do our application in uh, this manner. Then our application will be more scalable. Our application will be more robust. That's kind of things will come. So MVVM architecture pattern is a, is a product of uh, what you call um, a lot of trial and errors, a lot of uh, uh, software implementation, a lot of things that uh, we, we encountered and we come, uh, come to a conclusion, okay, this is the best way of doing that. Okay, so MVVM is such one pattern that we can use. And there are other patterns, as I mentioned, they, they might uh, address these problems differently. But in MVVM pattern, we, we have these opportunities, we have this, uh, we have this uh, way of coding, which will help us to develop massive applications. Okay, so make sure you guys uh, know that MVVM is just one pattern. It's not going to solve everything, but it has its own way, its own thing that we that we can work work on. Okay, so we will create a simple MVVM application. We, I won't be going through a uh, lot of layers, lot of uh, uh, lot of uh, lot of uh, implementation in our application. We'll just simply create an application and and. Uh, um, and we will just demonstrate the MVVM and what are the uh, what are the uh, what are the things it solves and how we can test it uh, as as we have discussed in the benefits of this pattern. Okay, so let me go to Android Studio. Um, I think you will you guys can I hope you guys can see Android Studio right now. Okay, if you don't, just let me know. So um, it's uh, make sure you, uh, if you if you want to follow along, you want to try this out, uh, have Android Studio installed, uh, simple process. Uh, make sure you have latest Java, Android SDK is up to date and you are good to go, okay? Um, so this is not gonna be what we call Android specific uh, code section. We will be just looking into MVVM architecture and learn a few things from there. 
So let's go uh, and create an MBBM architecture and see uh, how it works. So I'll create a new project. You guys can see the wizard, right? The new application wizard. Everything is visible or just you can see the uh, the project list that I'm having. Can you see the no activity, empty activity dialog? I'm not sure that's why I'm asking. No, sir, we can't. You can't, okay. I think I have to um, share the whole screen maybe. This sucks. Uh, let me, new project. Let's, uh, let's keep it this way. I think now you should be able to see. So uh, we'll, be, we'll be just creating a simple application, okay? Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, application um, um, templates that we can find. Uh, so there is basic view activity, MT view activity, uh, responsive, um, there are those uh, things uh, which related to uh, MVVM. I think they have removed it somehow. Okay, let's uh, let's just create a, a simple activity with the basic view activity. Okay, so I'm going to use this basic uh, application. Okay, and I will hit next. So these are like the uh, naming convention that we'll be using. So I'll, I'll just throw away some bunch of uh, dummy data, but uh, if you're following, uh, if you're trying to create a new, uh, brand new Android application, make sure you uh, enter the correct uh, details. For now, I'll just uh, have some dummy data. I will say uh, software, uh, soft, Soft architecture. I'll just say soft arch. And I will uh, go with the default things. I am not going to use uh, anything other than that. I will use my default mm, default packaging name. Language is going to be Kotlin. I'm not going to be using Java. Uh, and I'm going to select the uh, API version that I'm targeting. And this is simply saying that I will, uh, I will start, I will uh, target API 24. You know, for most of our application and build configuration, I will be using Kotlin DSL um, uh, uh, KDS uh, with these things. Okay, uh, for now, just it's like the build tool that we are using. And if I hit finish, um, I think it is downloading some new stuff. Uh, maybe I might, I might be outdated, this won't happen if you are using a latest version or a downloaded version. Make sure you have the latest uh, Android Studio if you are trying to uh, try this out. For me, I think the build tool is outdated. So let's give it a few seconds. If this comes again, I will uh, open one of the existing ones. Oh, this should uh, be not, it's not going to be a huge one. So like 57 megabits. Okay. Build tool is updated and it is generating. I think I have to share the screen again. Android Studio. Okay, so I hope everyone can uh, see this screen. Um, so simply, uh, it, it is downloading um, the uh, application that uh, we we want to uh, work with. Let me double check whether this is uh, MVVM compatible. Otherwise, we need to make sure. Um, MVVM stuff is here. Uh, Gradle has the source directory. 
اساسی این جاوا Okay. Okay. So, uh, in 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 since this is not uh, something related to Android and Android development, I uh, won't be going uh, with the uh, introduction to activities and what sort of uh, the build structure and everything. I'll be simply uh, focusing on the needfuls. Okay. So basically what, what we are having in here is a simple application. Uh, the application will have, let's say, we, it's going to have um, uh, one single activity. The single activity, activity is like, a, like what we see uh, when we start the application. It's going to be a view. And we have something called fragments. So fragments are smaller views or smaller pages, we can say. So activities is like the main entry point for our application and fragments are gonna be the smaller views that I'm gonna be uh, replacing. So when I first load the main activity, I will, uh, I will uh, load the first fragment um, as, um, um, as the main view. Then what I will do is uh, once I click on a button, I will go to the uh, second fragment or the second view that is like the basic application uh, at uh, at this point okay so the main activity is like the hosting for these two first fragments and uh, first fragment and second fragment so this is going to be our starting point and it will have some uh, buttons where we can interact and once these buttons are interacted it will show some uh, ui or snack bars what we call we will have some snack bars to show on, and we have uh, uh, we have uh, the first fragment. It will it will have a button where you can click on the first button, and it will go for the next view. That's the basic application. First, we will uh, run the application and see how it is, and we will show uh, we will see how synchronous programming works, how asynchronous programming works and how MVVM should be implemented and what are what are the benefits that you that we will get by using uh, these architectural patterns okay so we will do it uh, the wrong way and gradually we will make it the right way okay so that is our target for this uh, uh, this is this is going to be our target for this lecture okay so depending on the internet, uh, how, uh, how well updated you are, it will take a little bit of time to build. Um, so um, anyone who here have developed an Android application, raise your hand and I mean, you, you guys know what is the activity, what is a fragment. Anyone here knows all these jargons? Raise your hand, please. I know a little bit of Android. Raise your hand. Okay. If you are completely new uh, to Android and uh, you think you will have, you are having some hard time following along the NVVM architecture, um, I will link you guys with uh, one of the uh, introduction to Android. So you guys can check that out and it, it will add great value for your uh, profile as well. So you know how to build a, a, a properly architect Android application. Okay, it's, it's gonna be simple, nothing fancy, but uh, it will make uh, things easy for you and you guys can learn the new things and everything. So right now I'm not gonna go what are these files? What are these uh, build gradle files on all these things? I'll just skip through and I uh, assume that uh, you guys know these things, but if you do not, don't worry. 
I will link uh, the basic Android application development so you guys can easily um, get to know uh, what are the things that we are uh, looking in here. Okay, so I think my application is uh, ready to run. Okay, how I know that this play button is uh, is available. So I have uh, I have an emulator uh, with me. So setting up emulator is like uh, setting up a dummy device that you can run. You don't have to have an actual Android device to run. You just I'll just hit the play button. So once the application is compiled and everything is ready to move on, uh, we'll be able to uh, run the application and uh, see it in interaction in the uh, emulator section. In here, you can see the running devices section. It is booting up my emulator. And by the way, uh, one thing that you guys need to do, uh, check on the terms emulator and simulator. Okay, that is uh, that is a good point. Yeah, you can learn a lot of things. So I'll have it in the chat. This is the Zoom link. I might need this. Uh, learn the difference between emulator and simulator. Okay, learn the difference. You, you guys get an idea on that. Okay, so uh, you guys can see the application is uh, having some sort of uh, uh, data in here. So we have the first fragment to be seen and there is a button. We call these things as a fab. So when I click on the fab, replace with your own action, it is showing us snack bar. This is the simplest thing. And if I hit next, it will go to the second fragment. Okay. And there is a previous button. When I hit previous button, it will go back to the first fragment. Okay. So uh, think uh, the main activity relies on this section. And uh, the next button will just simply replace the first fragment with the second one. And it shows this view. Okay, so when we are cl clicking on the button, it's going to show us this nice message uh, that is in the main activity. Okay, so how do I know this is in main activity? There are, um, there is the view binding going on and navigation binding that we are doing. So in, in, in this scenario, we are, we are binding our values to this uh, floating action button. This is what we call a floating action button and we have interaction with this floating action button. So uh, we have named this as fab. Okay, the uh, ID for this one is fab. So basically what will happen in this piece of code is that uh, when you click on uh, the fab and we have a set on click listener and once you click on it, what will happen is it will show a snack bar, something like this. So, and it says, replace with your own action. I will say, uh, I'll say for instance, I want to replace this with iron beaker. Okay. And if I run this again, now the application should work uh, showing uh, iron beaker instead of that old message. You can see it says hi Ramdika and it 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 uh, interact with my application. So, so this is one of the example uh, for synchronous method invocation or synchronous calls. So, when we click on it, whatever should happen is going to happen within this uh, code section or code block. So, whenever we click on this tab or the button that we have in here this piece of code will be executed and you guys can see the snack bar and uh, calling this snack bar and showing it, it does not wait on anything. It does not wait uh, that we complete this or anything like that. It's, it's, it's gonna, sh it's gonna uh, execute this piece of code, execute this piece of code and it will work, okay? So this is what we call the synchronousness. Okay, 
whenever we execute and we get the data right back immediately, this is what we call a synchronous call. Okay, synchronous. Okay, so what we'll do, uh, what we'll do next is we will um, we will do the wrong way. Okay, we will do the wrong way and we will try to get some uh, value and show it in here. So uh, rather than uh, rather than uh, uh, rather than just showing this something synchronously, we will we will have some asynchronous calls. Asynchronous calls in the sense we will run something on background and we will get some data and I will put it in here. Okay. So the best asynchronous uh, thing that we can do right now is we will. Uh, we will use something called uh, a REST call, or we will uh, we will depend on an external uh, third-party call. So what we will do is we will um, we will uh, call out to an API and try to get that value in an asynchronous manner. Okay, not synchronous, but an asynchronous manner, and we will show it show the result back in here and. Uh, we will we will do the wrong way and we will move these things to different layers in asynchronous way okay all right first thing that we will need to do is we need to make sure that we are um, that we are calling uh, a rest api and getting our values so in order to do that uh, android um, android have some built-in mechanisms but those things are not very user friendly, developer friendly. So what we would do is we have third party libraries, third party libraries dependencies. So we can accelerate our things without writing everything by hand. There will be very easy bindings that we can do and we will use that binding to uh, change our data, okay? So what I will do is I will uh, use one of the familiar libraries. I'm not sure whether you guys can see this, but let me share once again. Okay. So uh, there is this library called Retrofit. It makes REST API calls in Android very simple. Okay. So I will integrate Retrofit. Retrofit. Android. Okay, so uh, this library, once you integrate this library, you can easily call these uh, APIs and get data. Okay, and uh, how you guys can see my screen, right? The uh, Google Chrome. I hope yes. Okay, so um, uh, in order to have uh, uh, in order to have retrofit, we, you guys can see we are using Gradle. We need to have this dependency in our application. By defining this dependency in our application, what will happen is it will get the latest version of retrofit, and the library will be available in my MVVM application. So I will go in here. And the place that I need to... Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Let's say you sharing WhatsApp screen. Oh, sorry. Then wrong. Uh, let me share it once again. Then. Mm -mm -mm. the share button. Okay. I have Android Studio, Google Chrome, Retrofit. Now you guys can see. Uh, no, okay. Sir. Okay, so uh, I am in the retrofit uh, retrofit uh, application. So go to the down down of this application, and you will see the uh, getting this latest jar. So what I need to do is I am using Gradle. So I need to. Implement, uh, I need to in, uh, have the uh, Gradle version. So I'll be copying this, going back to my Android Studio, 
and uh, I will be uh, I'll be sharing I'll be uh, um, integrating this in, within my uh, app section okay so if there are two gradle files make sure you know what each these stand for again if you need uh, further instruction check out the link that I will give it will give further uh, explain why these two greater files are, what are the purposes. Right now, I'll go to this implementation section right here, and I will paste this code. And insert the latest version. So I need to replace it the latest version right now. Okay, so I need to have the, uh, so uh, this is something that we need to make sure that when you are creating the application, the package names matters. So uh, I have this uh, retrofit uh, version. I need to get the retrofit latest version. I'm not sure uh, they are not picking it up. I think I need to get the exact version. Let's see whether the sync will do a good job. Uh, no, it's not going to do a good job. Um, so what I need to do is I need to get the latest version. I'll go to the uh, GitHub. Most of the time GitHub has the latest version. In here, yeah, uh, it is a profit 2.9.0. This is the latest version. So I'll be applying that in here. So what I'm saying in here, uh, get the retrofit 2.9 version within my application. That's it. Okay. And there is another additional uh, additional library that we need to uh, instantiate. That is the uh, JSON uh, converter factory. So I'll use one of these uh, implementations. I'll use the JSON implementation. Okay. So this is something also request required to work with uh, json implementation so i will say implementation retrofit json and i will have the 2.9 version okay so once the, everything is done i will hit sync now so what will happen on the background it will download the uh, retrofit and retrofit json uh, json converter and uh, we can use this library within my application. So that is that is how we are going to uh, have a third party dependency in our application. OK, so by now um, we have that. And I'm going to use uh, the simplest form, the simplest thing that uh, we can get. Uh, we will be using this um, GitHub service. So basically what it does is it's going to uh, call github and I am gonna create uh, a service and I am gonna get all the uh, repos or whatever the data available so it's gonna be pretty easy so um, first thing I need to do is create a github service interface so what I will do is I will go to my application uh, I will create something called a package name let's say I'll say GitHub or I'll say retrofit all together. Retrofit, all the retrofit configuration is going to be here. And I will create a Kotlin class and I, I'll just say name is like a retrofit. Okay. So I'll remove this. First thing I need to do is um, uh, have this. Uh, have this uh, applications uh, related stuff uh, put in in here. So I am the code that I paste is Java, and now it is giving me back um, the uh, uh, the uh, what do you call the uh, Kotlin code. It's automatically converted for me, so don't need to worry about that. There are several uh, import missing, so path call and repo a uh, few a uh, few uh, classes that i'm using especially the call one uh, let me fix these imports 
Android Telecom, the call should come from uh, Retrofit 2. Okay. The repo is the um, um, repository implementation or the repository um, uh, repository uh, class that we are going to be modeling. Okay. So we are going to get list of repositories. And the repository will look uh, some, uh, the repository will have something like username, passwords, and everything. We will look, uh, we, we will look into that uh, in a bit. Uh, or we can, I can just simply call the users API. So, what I'll do is I will call the API and see what are the available ones. GitHub. API, uh, API, and if I say users, uh, API, this, uh, it does not have, oh, okay, I don't need the API, API here, I think. Okay, so, this is the endpoint that I am going to be focusing on. So it's it's going to call API GitHub for slash dot com users, and it will give a list of users for me. So each and every user have this login and ID. So I am going to I'm be I will be interested in uh, uh, I'll be interested in these two values at least this login value. Or oh, I can just say. Uh, API users for slash one, it will give me uh, one single user. Okay, uh, let me check whether it is correct. Uh, use new, use edit. Should be one, uh, or is it a different ID? Maybe not the ID. Um, single user okay anyhow uh, at least uh, these same points were uh, I will be calling users endpoint. I will get a list of users. You can see that it is an array and it contains 30 items right around here. Okay. And one single item on this array will have a login and ID and a bunch of other things. So uh, I can model everything what I get back. So, but I'm only interested in login and ID. So I will model that only. So what I'll do is I will uh, create a user and login. Uh, I will um, I will uh, model that. So uh, rather than list repos, I will say list users. So it's more convenient what I'm doing. Uh, path, I don't think I need the path. I will just call the list users and I will get a list of users in here. Uh, so I will I, I need to model the users that I am interested in and uh, the user that I am interested in is let's say called user and it has an ID uh, which is the type of uh, I can just simply create a class a data class data class and The user will have an uh, ID of uh, long, and what else we had? Uh, we had login. Login is a string. So we have now login type of string. So I I will uh, I have a model. Uh, what I am expecting. I can model everything else as well, but right now, 
I'll be just interested in getting ID and login. Since this endpoint is gonna give a list of users, not a single one, I have to say, okay, this call, whenever we, when I am calling this uh, GitHub service, it will uh, go back to API for slash GitHub for slash users. So I am uh, explicitly removing this section because that section is gonna be something what we call a base URL. That means every call that we are doing is gonna have this URL fixed on. What's changing in here is only this user section. So I will keep that in mind and I will have the only user section in here. So if I call this, I will get a list of users. So this is my callback. So uh, I will get a list of users if I uh, if I call this GitHub service users method. Okay. The next thing that I need to do in the configuration uh, is to create a retrofit instance in here. So I'll create a retrofit. Actually, you can create a retrofit instance um, within the application within the uh, code itself. And you can call the get uh, uh, get everything uh, from there as well. Okay, let's since we are playing uh, the dirty way, uh, we are not doing uh, doing the good job manner. What we'll do is we will create the retrofit instance in the application, and we will call the service and everything from there. Okay, we have the retrofit. Uh, implementation. Now what we need to do, uh, when we have the first, uh, first, uh, first, uh, uh, first fragment, when we load the first fragment, I will create the retrofit instance. So I will be creating retrofit instance like this. So I can say uh, retro fit uh, retrofit dot build not giving me auto complete right private well uh, retrofit okay uh, it is gonna be equal to retrofit build and I I have to set the base URL and build method. That's it. So the base URL and build method. So I have a retrofit instance. But rest of its instance is not enough. I need to create a service, GitHub service like this. So I'll create a private var service and I will say retrofit uh, create and what I am expecting is a GitHub service. So I have to say GitHub service and I, I need to pass the class itself, Git, GitHub service class as well. So I have a service and the service is basically just saying um, create a GitHub instance out of this service. Okay, now I have the opportunity call this function list users so, so I should be able to get all the list users. So next thing that I need to do is call this once I uh, click on the button. Okay. So what I do is I will say service service. So it should be in the first fragment. Uh, first fragment has this button first. So it, it is navigating right now. I will comment that out. And I'll say service and list users. And we should say execute. Then it will return response or a call. And this response will have a body and the body will have a list of uh, users and i will get the zeroth one and i will have id and login let me just code 
like this and I'll show you guys login. Lock. 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 and I will say first fragment and I will say login. Grab it, login left, and set it there. Okay, uh, another thing that we need to do is uh, we need to make sure. Uh, the application that we are running is given uh, internet permission because we are using internet service. So in Android manifest uh, and the application, sorry, under and the manifest, I have to say users permission internet. Okay, without this permission, Android will uh, say, okay, uh, you you haven't allowed the Android application to make internet connections or internet activities. So make sure this is also there. So I'll uh, try to run. If let's see if we have any errors. First, and I have to build the locket. And what the locket message I give? This fragment. And if I hit next, okay, I think I hit uh, an error. Okay, that is okay. The, okay, uh, one thing I forgot that I need to uh, I need to register a converter. I add the dependency, but I forgot to create it. So uh, one thing we need to do is we need to add uh, the converter at converter factory. So I need, uh, I think I use JSON, JSON converter factory. I need to use this one, oops. Uh, Java. I think I need to provide an instance of it. This is connection factory. Um, let me check the documentation. Did I miss anything? Uh, JSON connection factory. Okay, I need to be um, call the create method. Um, create. Now we should be able to run it again. Let's see. Okay, again, the crash. Why uh, the crash happened? Uh, network process, the uh, network in on main thread. Uh, okay, the other thing that we need to do is um, we are not allowed to do. Uh, um allowed to run uh, asynchronous calls in the main thread that means the reason behind that is um if you guys can remember uh when we are um when we are running our application uh it it is running what we call the main thread 
the UI that you see in here, uh, the the interaction that we are doing is uh, some some it is running on the uh, thread call main that is mean a process called there is there is a process called main in Android. So that is responsible for uh, that is responsible for drawing our UI. And uh, it is a synchronous method that means it is running continuously. And what we are trying to do is when you are trying to do a asynchronous call in a synchronous manner, Android uh, Android says, so if you are rendering your UI and suddenly you are making asynchronous call and your UI rendering will stop. That means sometimes you guys can see the application um, crash uh, uh, or sometimes it is not responding. So that kind of thing will not make a good user experience. So by default, Android detects this kind of things and it says, hey, you are trying to block your user and what you need to do is make sure to run whatever the code that you are running in, uh, in a different uh, thread or you don't, do not run this in your U main UI thread, it will block your UI. Uh, so, uh, what we need to do is uh, uh, we need to make sure we are running, uh, we are not uh, running asynchronous things in, in a different, uh, we need to make sure we are not running these things in the main thread. So, we have something called uh, Kotlin coroutine. Okay, so Kotlin Kurudin, it's basically what we are doing is when we are running this, uh, when we are running this asynchronous call, when we are doing this asynchronous call, let's do not do it in the main thread, but we will do it in a, another thread. Okay, so that will make things easy. Uh, let, me sh let me get an example of that Kurudin code. All you have to do is make sure that um, this is the response issue. Uh, let talk on main thread exception. So uh, we need to run in a life cycle scope. Okay. So uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to run a synchronous code in, in a synchronous way. So what I will do is I will say, no, run this in a different context and make it work. So we have this life cycle, uh, life cycle scope, and I can say launch. Okay, so lifecycle launch. What will what this piece of code would do is rather than running this in the main thread, uh, rather than running the uh, asynchronous call in the main thread, which will block our UI, we'll just simply move that into a different thread. So we are not running on the main thread, but on a different thread. So our application uh, will not uh, hog or will not hold when we run the asynchronous call. Okay, so synchronous context, we are running asynchronous code, it will block our UI. To avoid that, we will run in lifecycle scopes. Okay, so it's like a sim simply a different thread. We call these things coroutines. Okay, let's see whether that works. Let me clear the log cat. So basically, when, when I'm uh, printing out anything in log.d, as you can see in here, uh, log.d, that means I am seeing those things in my log cat. Okay, so if I hit again, I am hitting an error. Um, network on major down. I think I fixed this. Uh -uh. Did I run this? Not fixed. Um, Let's see what we can do. Um, uh, uh, 
dispatcher, do I need to dispatcher? Something is missing, let me check. There is another nice guy with uh, context, right? Context dispatcher. Mm, dispatcher is not IO context. Mm. Mm, import device. So I need to make sure that is suspend. Okay, what I'll do is I will run this in a function. Function call network. Network. And within this function, what I'll do is I'll we have this all this code. I will say call net work. Network. So I need to suspend this. Uh, call only from coroutine or another suspend. Okay, I need to call this in a coroutine. Okay, I think I can say lifecycle scope launch. And I can this. Okay. Private. Let's run it again, see whether the network calls make it. Okay, it's not breaking. I'll clear this out. Yeah, so let me go back and uh, you guys can see that uh, it is showing the first element, uh, first elements response. So what I have basically done in here is uh, I will uh, once 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 the button is clicked, uh, I will launch a new scope. That means you are, as I mentioned earlier, we are not allowed to run uh, any uh, code, anything uh, that blocks our UI. So we will create a new coroutine. It's like a mini thread. So we will create a separate thread. It is out of the scope of the main thread and we will run it in here. And what these basically simply what we are doing is we are calling the network call and we need to uh, assign a dispatcher for that, which dispatcher it will work on. That means there are three dispatchers on Android. That is main, IO and uh, uh, default main and un uh, unconfined. So normally we will go with IO since this is a IO related thing. We are doing a network call. And basically we are using the service class that we have defined and we are getting the uh, values from there. So we call the service.listusers method. So in by calling this out, simply it's, it's gonna call this endpoint, this endpoint and it will get the list of users. You guys can see there are a lot in here. So uh, get users execute will return the list of users. I will uh, I will have that express. 
and within that rest this is the body this is what we are getting so uh, within the body you will get a list list of users so what i need to do is i will get the first one first user out of this that is the uh, first element that's in the array and from that even i will take the uh, uh, key login that means i am interested in login so whatever the value for login in here is mojombo and i will print it out like this uh, the first fragment if if it is if the login value is there what i'll do is i will print it in here basically uh, the first element i will take the first element and print it in here so that's the basic thing that i have done so uh, in it, uh, i have made it two that means i will get the second element and if i hit next under look cat i can see the second element value if i go in here first element and the second element is this one index is starting at zero that's why so basically what i have done is i have uh, get the uh, get some data from retrofit and i have created a service which i can access the retrofit you uh, retrofit uh, data and once i click it once i click on this uh, simple button it will call the network layer it will call the api and out of that list sorry out of that list i will get the second element and from even that i will I'll be interested in login i can take another values like id uh, as well so since i i have uh, uh, have that so login is the one i'm interested in if I am interested in other thing like not the ID, avatar URL, I need to make sure I um, have these things modeled. So if I want to have URL, make sure to update the um, update the uh, representation in here. And uh, in here, you can say simply say URL. Now uh, it will show the URL of the second person. So I go to look at and I hit this button. Um, seems to be the URL is back now. I'm sure. Okay, I got the URL. It's took a little bit time. <laughs> so uh, you guys can see that uh, we we got the values and everything from the first fragment and there are several things that we have seen in here first thing is that we have seen synchronous calls okay we call a value and we get the value back uh, in main activity you can easily see when we call the uh, when we call the uh, fab button that is on the bottom in here and we immediately got the response uh, and we show it so we have no waiting. We are not depending on any uh, network calls, any IEO related calls. We just got the value from there. Okay. And this is what we call a synchronous call. All right. And we we had to create uh, we have we we had to create a retrofit instance in here. You guys can uh, see the steps again if you want. Create a retrofit instance. Create a service, and once we uh, once we create once we hit on that service, once we hit uh, the uh, the next button in here. So what will it what will it do? It it will create a asynchronous call. So Android prohibit uh, asynchronous calls happening in the main thread uh, to keep the application alive in the main thread. Otherwise, the main thread will get stuck your app will not respond so we need to make sure the uh, asynchronous call that we are doing uh, it is running out of the main thread so what we use is the lifecycle scope launch to create a new thread and once it is done once it is done uh, the dispatcher will uh, give us back the values 
and the values that we are interested in. It's going to be list of GitHub users. And with that GitHub users list, I will be taking the second one. And, and in, in, even with the second one, I will be interested in the URL parameter or URL key that the REST API is sending me back. Okay, then I will just simply uh, print it out. Or I can just uh, I can just uh, bind it in here. It's up to the user what we need to do. So I think uh, if I have the correct bindings, I can do that as well. Let's see the first fragment. Uh, resources, layout, first fragment. Mm. So I have a text view. Do I have an ID for that? If I have an ID, I can. Uh, I have a text. ID is text view first. Maybe I can bind it as well. Let's see. Uh, bindings. Binding. Uh, text view first. Set text. Text equals uh, URL. So login. So what I have done is uh, when I'm getting the value, uh, I I will put this uh, dummy text uh, with the URL. So it will change the URL, change the text. So if I hit next, okay, something went wrong. Uh, only original thread that created the view hierarchy can touch its view. Okay, something um, I need to uh, call this in a different context. That might be the issue. Uh, I think I can run it in main thread and it works. Let's see if this works. And it still crashes. Okay, so for now, just we will just ignore that we are setting that. Right now, we are getting that value and we are show it in locket. So this this app works, right? This app is showing something that we are getting from internet. It it shows it works. At least it's uh, showing in the locket. So this what what we call a spaghetti code. Okay, this this is mm, as I mentioned earlier. If this is the only function within our application, we can consider this is ah, okay. We don't have to worry about anything else. This works. Okay, this works, and it 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 is um, as as we speak, it works somehow. Okay, but the problem is, is this scalable or is uh, is this application uh, will be enough us to develop something far more greater, far more scalable, far more advanced. Okay, so you guys can see this uh, this kind of code. We have the logic, the uh, sorry, the, we have the uh, what do you call the data layer. Okay, but, but we but if 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 I'm talking about where we want to get the data, we are getting all these things from retrofit. Okay, we have that in here, and we have the business logic where we convert everything and do the logging. We have the business logic in here, and also we have the buttons and everything all in one code. Okay, so this in this architecture, what will happen is we we do not have separation of concerns. We do not, uh, we, we cannot uh, separate things in, in our application, okay? So for example, um, we, 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 when, when we are trying to, uh, uh, when we are trying to do some changes, uh, we can't, uh, we can't even do that. Uh, let's see. I think I can say uh, lifecycle event launch. 
within the launch function I can bind the plus uh, plus x equal text maybe okay not sure this is work let's try that yeah it's so it's working after we if I if I put it in a law uh, life cycle scope and it is changing so I have the logic in here. I have the everything in here. So let's say I, I want to append some uh, text in here. Uh, login URL URL is, and I want to say login. And I am doing a custom uh, custom logic in here. So basically, in the data layer. What I will get is this login, okay? And uh, in my business logic, I want to say, okay, rather than showing the login, I want to change it to URL login is, okay? So I am doing some sort of concatenation, string concatenation. So even this is a logical thing, okay? So log the logic is, rather than showing login, I will say login URL is, okay? So I am changing something i am doing some modification to see so this is what we call a business logic so i'm doing a business logic in here so business logic is in the same application uh, application call everything in here in uh, data layer is in here everything that uh, that uh, the application need to run is within in here okay so someone can argue yeah, this is working. If this is the expected architecture, if this is the expected behavior, yeah, go ahead. This is completely fine. But as I mentioned earlier, if the application is getting more and more complex, this will not work. Okay, in 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 that scenario, believe me, having everything in here. Say for instance, I want to test my business logic. Okay, my business logic is simply. Uh, if I give the login URL, the business logic would should the logic should append login URL is okay. So if I give URL, just the login URL, I need to return login URL is okay. The business logic is simple; it is manipulating it, but even that, it is a logic. Okay. So if I want to test this business logic, if I want to test this business logic if i give a normal url it it should return something appended to it that is the logic that i want to test i can't test this unless i go everything in here i need to i need to make sure if a retrofit is loaded i need to show the fragment is loaded i need to show, make everything uh, these uh, coroutines are going and everything is doing unless i need Unless I have this first fragment loaded in, first fragment is ready uh, for me. I can't test my business logic. My business logic, I cannot test. Okay. So that's one of the downside of having this spaghetti code. Okay. And other thing is, let's say, for example, the uh, UI designer. Okay. UI designer. Uh, should uh, think about these routines, these everything, uh, data binding and everything. So it's it's not gonna make the life easy for a developer as well as uh, a data binder. He should put every code in here, the logics and everything in here, and the UI designer will interact with here. The code is gonna be messy when we are trying to merge it together, when we are trying to uh, bridge the gap between these two application it's gonna be get messy okay even how how much we try we will lose a lot of time getting uh, these uh, two implementers codes into one single code okay so uh, given this situation uh, this spaghetti code is can be considered as uh, something uh, not scalable at all Okay, so what we need to do, we need, we need to make sure, okay, we know the pattern, we know the architecture, 
we can separate the concerns. We can separate the concerns uh, like what we have seen in the India architecture. So simply, we will uh, separate each one of these layers and create the same application in more robust way. Okay. All right. Um, so next thing that we need to do in order to get MVVM ready, there are a couple of libraries that we will need. Otherwise, um, the reactiveness, as I mentioned earlier, the observability reactiveness, those things do not come by default uh, with Android systems. So uh, what we need to do is we need to uh, have those dependencies installed because uh, the reason behind that uh, some people may like MBVM, some people do not like. So in, in a case, uh, 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 other people have uh, yeah, uh, the uh, let's say let's say they have they are using something else, so they should be able to uh, try it uh, try it it out. So um, uh, so what we what we do is we will uh, we will uh, do the uh, um, necessary uh, binding necessary uh, third party libraries additions and we will we'll be able to uh, get the MVVM uh, ready, okay? Let's see um, what are the dependencies we need. I'll probably gonna use one of my old projects. Mm, okay. Give me a second and find in the old project. Mm -hmm. And open and just need the dependency, and I'm good. Retrofit motion build yeah, I need uh Android X lifecycle events and view model uh, these two. Okay. Got it. Open and recent project. Okay, so uh, to introduce MVVM, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, these things like uh, do not come um, um, do not come uh, by default. So what we need to do is uh, we need to make sure uh, that 
we 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 introduce these third party dependencies so don't worry these are like uh, provided uh, provided by uh, uh, by uh, android uh, or uh, at least from uh, uh, google's uh, repositories so we don't uh, we do not have to uh, worry that much into the like the security and everything um next thing that we will do is like data integration okay let me go back So you guys, I'm opening the project and it is giving some errors. We open number in the that would make more sense. Android. This device it will take a long time. What I'll add, I'll add is a life cycle event and live data view models. So let me go back into my Java and create a script. Make sure I'm using the app one. So we have the app compact constraint layout navigation. So I will be implementing this too. Uh, I think there should be a latest version. This is like an old code, but still the concepts are same. Uh, okay, so let me check whether I have I have this correct version. Make sure these versions match as well. Otherwise, what will happen sometimes? Um, um, sometimes these things uh, uh, mismatch with each other. Uh, for example, um, uh, if I have uh, 
constraint layout uh, sorry if i have like a different kotlin version and the view model sometimes it conflicts but this one should not conflict that much because it's a separation of layer as i mentioned earlier these layers should not interact with each other in any way so let's go uh, to the application and uh, let's create our first because um, um, uh, we'll create our view model okay and we will see how we can uh, create a one simple C simple view model and try to offload this uh, logic into a different place. Okay, uh, so rather than um, I am constructing everything in here, I will uh, have a separate package for our view models. Uh, view models, okay. So in, in here, uh, I will uh, create a view model for our first fragment. So uh, I will name this one as um, uh, first fragment. First fragment view model. So I know, okay, this view model is associated with the first fragment. Otherwise, there will be a lot and it will uh, hard uh, to keep on track. I think I need to rename this better to have uh, refactor, rename. I should be simple, refactor. Okay. So uh, when we are creating a view model, that means we are in, uh, we are creating an interaction point with uh, with the uh, other party. Other that means with the view. So in order to create a view model, we have this simple view model class that we can extend. Okay, so I will extend sure. the view model class. We view model which is coming from android lifecycle which is the library that we just uh, just uh, incorporated so we have our view model in here that is fine and what we need to do is we need to make sure that our view model is uh, view model is uh, inject to, to inject to the uh, first fragment okay the first fragment should know about this view model. So what? how do we do that uh, in uh, view model? So we have something, uh, uh, something, uh, some way of injecting these things. We will keep this retrofit and service layers hidden for now, okay? Sure. We will just uh, keep these methods, um, what do you call, uh, commented out. Okay, we will need that code. Right now, uh, if you guys can remember, uh, we, we have the connection between view and the view model. So view knows about the view model. View can send direct messages or direct communication to the view model, but view model should not interact directly with the uh, directly with the uh, view itself okay let's see this in action so first thing that we need to do is we need to interact with uh, we need to initiate a view model so i will say let init var and i will name this view model and uh, the view model is gonna be the uh, first fragment view model Okay, so I am going to create a view model and it is going to be the type of first fragment view model. Okay, so we have the first fragment, we have the view model. Now we need to initiate that. We need to make the creation of this. We need to bind this value. It's not going to create an instance. So on create view, we have this uh, view model. And we have this view model, view model factor, view model provider. And who is providing uh, on behalf of this? And I will say get first fragment view model. 
Euh, et 